This is a summary of Pathwork Lecture 64, which is Outer Will and Inner Will. And as part of this explanation, uh, my sense this month is that people sometimes got a little frustrated with the idea of constantly segregating different parts of the personality, will, spirit, into different sections and giving them names. And I describe this process in the sense of the human being, the biological human being, is a very complex organism. And uh, to understand the organism as a whole, uh, medical students, uh, students of anatomy, students of human beings, need to examine the whole, but also understanding how specific parts interact. For the example I came up with was skin. Skin is the largest organ in the human body. And it's actually composed of three layers. Now, when we say skin, we think skin. Uh, but there are three different layers. It can be important to understand the functions, the origins, the specific gifts and difficulties, limitations of each layer, how they operate, what their constraints are, what they require to function adequately and also to understand what happens if one layer isn't functioning well. An example is that during surgeries, the skin is cut through. And even though it heals, the scar tissue seals together the three layers so that there's not a, the little throughways for the lymphatic, lymphatic system are cut off in that area. So there's a, a small spiritual healing modality and actually massage technology for working with scar tissue so that you encourage the three different layers to resolve and open up so that they all function well. I mention that because when we study inner will and outer will, like skin, we're not trying to pretend that one part is independent of another part. And yet, if we understand in a spectrum the extreme of outer will, which emanates and functions based upon the personality, the mind, context, culture, versus the other extreme end of inner will, which would be connection to the divine, a sense of inner knowing, one's conscience. These are not independent organisms. They don't function without each other. Uh, and there's a spectrum. And of course, in that spectrum, it might be difficult to tell one from the other. The idea in this lecture is to crank up the contrast, which is true anytime we examine different aspects of our being, to crank up the contrast, to look at the extremes, so that we get a sense of what outer will uh, excels at and the importance of inner will and why inner cannot function without outer. Outer cannot function without inner. The trick is that the outer may appear to be functioning well while it is actually disconnected from the inner. And the inner may be quite healthy and the outer may be collapsed. So by studying the unique features, unique qualities of the extremes of these, the hope is to create a more integrative uh, flow of communication between the two layers and understanding of what they do and why, 
and therefore to notice when there's an imbalance. So again, the outer can look healthy at, while the inner is crippled. Um, and so by being aware of what the inner will is, we may be able to notice that before it goes destructive. If the inner will becomes crippled, you will experience pain. You will experience destructive behaviors, destructive outcomes, because as a mechanism, part of us isn't functioning. As if an organ in your body was failing, you won't notice it in the beginning. You might notice a little difficulty when it gets serious, and then if it fails, you go into crisis. So the hope is that we will notice an imbalance early and be able to rebalance and understand the mechanisms between the two, the balance between the two, uh, to avoid crisis. Crisis being the prior month's uh, lecture, Patrick Lecture 183. So learning to tell the difference between the two can be important. Um, so again, it's divided into four sections. I read a lecture and I just arbitrarily, but I find that there are usually four different concepts at least in every lecture. And the first section I, I used to differentiate uh, inner will versus outer will. And what I find in the lectures, even though they are very wordy, uh, the sentences are long and it can be very confusing. I, to this day, will read a section of a lecture and stop and go back, and in my mind, I'm doing sentence diagrams, trying to find the verb, and, and putting in invisible parentheses, and period, ah, okay, if I put a comma there, then that hanging phrase makes sense. Please understand that the lectures were transcribed from an oral lecture, and uh, there's a tendency to not constantly edit over the years. But when you present a lecture, when you read a lecture, most of us put in extra parentheses and commas and periods and to, to make the phrasing, the original phrasing, easier to understand from the written page. So sometimes when I go through a lecture, what I do is I do it electronically and I just hit return every time I see the end of something. And sometimes what you can come up with are lists of bullet points. Now the lectures aren't um, structured like that. The lectures are not presented in written form like a worksheet can be presented but you can make a worksheet very easily out of a lecture without changing a single word. So in the first section I did that and I created two columns, qualities, characteristics of the outer will, qualities and characteristics of the inner will. So in summary, uh, the outer will is personality based. It is driven by agendas it becomes captured in forcing currents to get things done. The outer will, its job is to manifest. So like the joke where if all you have is a hammer, you're always looking for a nail and you don't know what to do with a screw, the outer will is a hammer and it's trying to finish things, it's trying to manifest things. The inner will uh, does more tweaking. It, it works to align us. Inner will is not perfect. The inner will is not God. The inner will is not pure spirit. The inner will is our inner will. And our inner will is attempting to align. It is not trying to give us away to a superior authority. It is attempting to align our purpose here our unique spiritual task with spiritual law, with spiritual intent, to keep it clean. So the inner will is, there's a balancing going on in the inner will, and sometimes there's no balancing at all going on in the outer will. It, it decides, this is what I need to do, and that's what I'm going to focus on. And the inner will needs to raise its hand and say, we, we, we did that, 
and we don't need to keep doing that. We need to let that go. There are more things to do. Come on back. Let's realign, and then we'll go out again. So in the first section, uh, we focused on learning to tell some energetic differences between inner and outer will. Uh, second section was on the misconception about selfishness. There's a concept of enlightened self-interest that works well with pathwork concepts. And that idea is that what is best for you is best for me. Today, no. What may be best for you today may mean that there's left cake on the plate, less cake left on the plate for me. However, in the larger sense, in the more adult, mature sense, if you are fed and happy and clothed, your energy output will be more positive, more constructive, and ultimately it will make my life better. But this is not a tit-for-tat type of enlightened self-interest. This is a broader context. In a day-to-day -day format, you're still supposed to take care of yourself. You're not supposed to let people on the street knock you down and get you hurt. You're not supposed to abandon your needs just because somebody else has needs. So uh, raising your hand or taking your share, even taking more than your share, is not inherently a bad thing. It is part of the imperfect human struggle to try to find balance. In Pathwork, balance is not static. Balance is meant to be dynamic. We attempt to find balance, and that means that we are not in balance. We realize that and we correct. Oh, we're overcorrected. It's a very light, lovely, back and forth process, constantly reinforced by feedback. Think of it this way. And a living person is not static. If a human being was perfectly still for an extended period of time, they'd die. We require movement in order to nudge the blood along different capillaries. We require movement to keep the nourishment flowing in our bodies. And there is always movement even when we appear to be standing still. This is the form of balance that the inner will focuses upon. The outer will is free to oscillate more broadly. Okay? But there needs to be communication between the outer and the inner. So back to misconception about selfishness. If selfish is perceived as me versus you, that's dualistic. So that's, that's not going to ultimately help. It's not a good long-term strategy. But if selfishness is about a momentary state where I need to focus on my needs and I, I just don't have the time, the energy, the, the resources to help you out. For this moment, I need to be selfish. This is not a bad thing. It, it, it's part of what we have to do during the day, during the week, during a month. What we want to watch out for is this is not intended to be a permanent state. There's supposed to be this organic balance back and forth. Now, as children, what many of us have experienced, because our parents were imperfect, is that, and I'm, I'm going to build this little case uh, based upon a decent human being being a parent. I know that there are extremes where people are terrible parents, but there's so many extremes you can't talk about every case. So let's assume that there's a generous and loving parent. And they've still got agendas. They still have preferences. I remember when my children were small, I was, I'm an introvert. Uh, even though I do public speaking, uh, I don't do social. I'm, I'm very private. And so when my children came along, they were very social and they wanted time and they wanted interaction. And sometimes I just, I felt exhausted. 
what happens with an introvert is we feel that it, it, rather than social interaction enlivening us as it does an extrovert, social interaction sometimes feels draining. So for me, for many people, I have to put a stop to social interaction. I need to go into my cave, my internal world and recharge. I had to do this with my children. Um, not being a perfect parent, sometimes you just go in your room and shut the door. Sometimes you yell at them. What I'm building here is a case for where a parent may, when attempting to meet their own basic needs, may accuse a child of being selfish. When the child is not being selfish, the child is trying to fill their basic needs. And the adult misuses their authority, uh, sees the situation from their viewpoint rather than attempting to refer honestly referee. And the adult says, you're selfish and I have needs and you're not meeting my needs, so you're selfish. If a child absorbs this, a child can come to think that any time it tries to get its needs met, it's being selfish. That is a misconception about selfishness. So we wind up with this terrible tension. If I try to meet my needs, I'm selfish equal bad. I am selfish equal I won't be loved. But if I'm giving to you and I'm not getting my needs met, you might love me, but I don't get my needs met. Now, neither is a solution. And we either stick on one side or the other, or at worst, bounce back and forth, never finding anything that works uh, and muddying the waters. So this is what the guy is referring to when he talks about misconception about selfishness. Why does this belong in a lecture on outer will and inner will? The inner will is aware of the deep need for getting our needs met, as well as a deep need to care for others. And the discrepancy, the human real life back and forth decision making that is required to attempt to maintain a balance here. But the outer will may feel driven and it gets engaged in a forcing current. The guide describes forcing currents as they're, they're prompted by a sense of, of needing to survive. And they're based on the dualistic thinking of life-death. Whenever I'm faced with a life-death solution, I'm going for life. So the outer will reaches for life whenever it sees a life-death choice. And it doesn't look back. So if the outer will is dominant, it may go off on a certain direction and not look back and not listen to the inner will in terms of reassessing, reevaluating. So a misconception of selfishness in childhood can give rise to an adult who just doesn't understand the back and forth give and take necessary in, as a mature adult among other reasonably mature adults. Um, in the third section, uh, we talk about the inner conflict of this very back and forth process that can lead to a sense of hopelessness. I cannot understand this. I cannot fix this. But if you'll remember the mention of the survival mechanism, we don't give up. So if I find myself in a place of hopelessness, resistance will begin. Resistance is a survival mechanism. I cannot lay like a puddle on the floor. I have to take care of myself. I have to survive. And that takes the form of resistance. Uh, the guide speaks of a, sometimes the guide goes into an extended metaphor, this one's a whole big paragraph, about how this can turn out to be 
like seeing a little stone that is part of a big house. And we may over-focus on the stone and know it very, very well. But we need to see the big house. We need to see the bigger picture. So again, what this, what Pathwork is about is if you realize that there can be an inner conflict and you find it within yourself, and then you see where you did go into hopelessness and where you rebounded from that and the outer will is the part of you that would rebound, it can help you understand why you feel a strong dynamic to do things in life that has overwhelmed your ability to dialogue with your own inner will. The last section is on uh, the larger picture. So shifting from outer to inner laws is actually an entire lecture, Catholic Lecture 227. And it speaks of the human race, um, the human species, the human experience in totality. Uh, so it speaks of the entire planet entering a new stage of development. Now I'm gonna do a sidebar here. Um, I notice that for many years I mocked certain modalities. I mocked tea leaf reading. I mocked astrology. I mocked horoscopes. I uh, mock meaning I degraded, I put it down, I laughed at it, I dismissed it as unimportant. And it went further than that. Basically what I was mocking was anything I didn't understand. So I also mocked chiropractics, I mocked uh, energy systems, I mocked the very practice that I have devoted my life to at this point. It's important to realize in your life, or in my life, it is important for me to realize where I downgraded so many ways of understanding the world, because I didn't understand them. What Patrick has brought to me is a deeper understanding of what all these different modalities may represent, which is number one, human beings looking for resonance for their inner voice. Here's what I mean by that. What I discovered over time by exploring these very modalities that I laughed at, I discovered their grain of truth. Not meaning to diminish them to a grain. What I mean is they don't resonate for me, but I began to understand that they did resonate and there is truth in them. Just like the guide says that there is truth in every significant religion of any seriousness, any philosophy. There is truth in any modality whose goal is to find truth, divine wisdom, or to unearth the inner voice. The modality is vulnerable to the ability of the practitioner to stay focused on truth and inner voice and guidance than to be swayed by technique or the influence of, um, um, trying to find the word here, how they were taught to walk through the steps. So you can be taught to walk through a modality, to walk through a practice in a certain way, but the intention is for that to come off the page, for you to absorb that as a one, two, three step instructional for thought, for interpretation analysis that isn't as easily bullet pointed. I hope that makes sense. What I'm, what I'm trying to integrate here is the guide talks about the entire planet entering a stage of development and the analogy that came to me immediately was the song from Hair, the musical Hair, talking about the age of Aquarius, which is one of the things I used to mock. 
And yet here's the guide saying we're entering a new stage of development. And I now understand that people in different modalities, people in different structures, people in different uh, philosophical views may name that differently. And yet they're still aligned with the inner truth of a new stage of development. So whether you want to call this the age of Aquarius, the new millennium, or any number of other ways to describe how people are growing up, the guide takes human development and analogizes it to uh, the individual life of a human being talks about the childhood stage of human development, talks about the adolescent stage of human development, and then the early adulthood stage, and then the more mature, and then there's an elder phase. What the guide is describing here is that we have left our adolescence where we were dependent upon outer authority and outer laws to define boundaries and we are entering a stage where we need to learn the truth and wisdom of our inner voice and let that slowly displace outer laws and outer authority this is not an invitation for rebellion revolution or anarchy but perhaps you can see where that's part and parcel of this process. That because like the spectrum of inner and outer, there is no moment when this happens. It's a gradual process and different people will feel into this at different levels with different abilities to interpret, with different agendas already in motion and will react differently to a revelation than others. And so for me, this helps explain why right now the planet is in the throes of such trauma, uh, resistance, uh, argument, such duality, my way, your way, that we are entering a new stage where we do need to honor our inner voice and rather than discard outer very very slowly replenish it with the richer voice of the inner self inner conscience purified of outer agendas that may sound a little complicated so Again, the guide starts listing steps to explore illusions. And with my little keep hitting the return button and creating new carriage returns and creating new lines, uh, it was fairly easy to divide five or six or seven paragraphs into the equivalent of bullet points so that it is easier to see that the guide is describing nine different steps for exploring your illusions. So this is what I do in the study guides. Um, I hope you take a look at them. They are on my websites, janrigsby.org and janrigsby.com. Uh, I encourage you to read the actual lecture, Patrick Lecture 64, Outer and Inner Will, Outer Will and Inner Will, uh, which is on the patrick.org website. And thanks for listening.